Hi everybody, my name is Altanat and this is Board Game Inquisition, the place where I love to give you insights and information about the board games you might just want to have in your own collection someday. So Oath is a game that I really wanted to love more than I actually did. So here's five things I think you need to know about it. Oath Chronicles of Empire and Exile is a game in which you are trying to gain a position of power in an ancient land. You can play as an exile or as a citizen trying to bring about change or even as the chancellor holding on to the old order. On your turn you'll use your supplies to interact with various locations on the board. Doing things like gathering your forces and battling your foes. Activating and interacting with other factions via favours and exploring the map. Once someone meets a victory condition, it's game over. But your legacy continues in the history of Oath, as each game affects the future of the next. Thing 1. What's this game all about? So Oath is a title that really focuses on the idea of vying for power in a kingdom. In it, you can take on one of three roles, where you can be the exile, you can be the citizen, or you can be the chancellor. And depending on which one you play, you'll have a different way to win. And these vary as well from game to game. But usually they centre around things like gathering titles, such as Oathkeeper, or gathering banners perhaps as well, such as like the favour of the people. So you can see how it represents you kind of gathering those around you to support your push for the throne. As for theme, I'm calling this some sort of political intrigue because it really is one of those games where you're kind of elbow rubbing with friends and watching to see what everyone else is up to. Like you really should keep your friends close and your enemies closer in this because somebody can really rob your victory out from under your nose. Now, story wise, like, OK, it's got a good setting here, but I don't know if there's much of a story really happening. Now, it's possible to create your own stories based on kind of the cards you're interacting with and stuff like that. I know we did that when I played. For example, I had the assassin advisor um, to go with my character, so everyone thought I was incredibly ruthless. Um, and so you can kind of concoct that yourself. What's interesting, though, is that while the game's story element isn't particularly strong, it does have a history element. And this comes about at the end of each game you've played, depending on what happened in the game, will determine how the setup for the next game goes. Um, and that will include things like changing cards and decks. Um, the new capital city will have belonged to the previous winning player and I think it's a really interesting touch. However, it's something that stays in the background a little bit more than in the foreground. Um, finally, you play as a character who doesn't really seem to have any kind of story or anything like that, which I missed a little bit. In fact, the only difference between the characters is kind of the, the meeple you get to play as. So overall, um, Oath, well, is it a similar game to anything else? Not really. Oath is its kind of its own jam, but you will find that you know, the mechanics in it are familiar, um, but they're just done in a different way. Thing two, what kind of actions are you going to be performing on your turn? Well, firstly, let me say that Oath is a large and complicated game, so I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty here, but I will give you some of the highlights. So the first thing to note about Oath is that it is really a resource management game. On your turn, you're going to get a number of supplies um, and it's up to you to use them wisely to activate a number of actions that are available to you out on the board to kind of work your way towards whatever specific victory you might have. So these are things like moving between locations, bolstering your troops, attacking other players, gaining favours with other factions and such. Um, so there's a whole host of things that you can do. But the real puzzle here, you know, boils down to basically how efficient can you be on your turn? Um, you're going to want to get as much as possible out of everything um, to maximise the benefits. 
Um, now, the cool thing here is that, you know, you can interact with the board and these other factions for kind of great ways to bolster your turn. It's like having cards in your hand without having them in your hand. Um, and these other factions are very interesting because they come with their own kind of pool of favours, which is limited. So when you interact with them, you can get their favour tokens and then use them for other things. And also sometimes when you interact with them, you have to pay for it too and return those favours to the exact same pool. So what it means is you don't want to milk one faction too much because they'll run out of favours and they'll have nothing to give you. This is interesting, however, when it comes to other players who are interacting with specific factions and you could go and empty out their favour pool if so desired. Um, and there's a lot of stuff like that in the game where really it is about aggravating other players and trying to keep them away from victory as long as possible till you can claim yours. And that really is what the nature of this game about is about and what it all kind of comes back to at the end of the day. Now, mechanics wise, if you're playing this at two players, you must play it with an AI player, the Clockwork Prince. And it determines its actions based on kind of the game state when its turn comes round. Um, I didn't like it at all. I found it really unwieldy um, and really not much fun to use. I don't think my, neither myself nor my partner wanted to play as an extra character. It's not that kind of game, I feel. Um, so yeah, I just thought you should know that I was disappointed that I, we couldn't just, you know, play it as a pair, that you had to have this third piece. Overall, however, I think the mechanics in Oath are really interesting and really fluid. Lots of things can change quite quickly and you'll have to kind of alter your plans on the fly. But I do love how direct it was about telling me what I needed to do to win. Um, yeah, this is an interesting game to play in where things can change quickly, um, but sometimes in your favour. Thing three on the table. So yeah, without a doubt, this game is lovely when it's all set up and laid out. It's bright, it's interesting, it's colorful. It's got all the good keywords. Now size-wise, I'm not a big fan of the neoprene mat. I think it's a little bit oversized um, because it will only fit one way on my table if I put it like in the center lengthways. If I were to put it sideways as I would often do with a game board so people can see it all, it actually falls off the edges of the table. It's so long. Um, and that's before you even add in things like player boards um, and the clockwork prints and then all the tokens and access to those things. Um, yeah, it's quite, a, it takes up a lot of space and it's quite busy too. There's a lot going on. Um, the good news is, however, is that setup for this game doesn't take a particularly long amount of time. And that's because you do all the setup prep when you tear the game down. Um, so at the end of each game, depending on who won, um, that will alter kind of the cards and things you play with in the next game. So you have to do all that adjusting after you've played rather than at the start of the next game. Um, we found it to be a little bit fiddly and incredibly specific. You had to be very careful where individuals' cards had ended up and things like that. And overall, just a little bit of a burden. Um, now, if the game is supposed to take eight rounds to play, but you start rolling a dice for it if somebody is the Oath Keeper after the fifth. Um, and it takes about 90 minutes for our two of us to play. The rule book, oh, it's a bit of a travesty. Um, the player boards it tell you what your actions are but finding out specifics for those was difficult and not easy we often found there were a ton of exceptions to everything you thought you knew um and beyond that it was just sometimes how things were put together like so all of the stuff would be lumped into one paragraph and you'd be looking for a single answer um so it wasn't easy to navigate um i'm not gonna lie after playing the game five or six times now we still had to look up the rule book for something like every 10 15 minutes um, and that's just, oh, it's a travesty. <laughs> it's a travesty. Um, however, replayability wise, there's lots here. Um, there's a huge selection of cards and things to play with and they alter every time you play. So you get to add in more and see new ones and fresh ones. And I really, really like that about that. So this is a game you could play a lot of. Thing four, how does this game look and feel? Well, I'm sure you might have noticed by now, but everything about this game screams quality and deluxe. And the art from Kyle Farron has really, you know, stepped it up a notch here um, where the artwork seems to go between the mysterious and the humorous and then back again. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. And I look forward to seeing new cards when we played. They were always kind of interesting and exciting. Um, I'm not going to waste more of your time here. This game really does just have everything. It's got game trays. It's got metal coins. It's got 
like printed to 3D tokens. It's got thick cardboard. It's got a neoprene mat. Like I can, and even, you know what, a little kind of journal for you to chronicle all your adventures in. Yeah, and everything's here. You couldn't ask for more. Thing five, is this game actually any good? <sighs> That's a really tough question. I'm kind of torn here because do I think the game's good? Kind of. Um, do I think it's hard to get to the good stuff? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with my, my main issue here, which is the, the rule book. And on the one hand, I think there actually has been a really large effort to make the game easier to learn and to understand for people. I just don't feel it was particularly successful in my case. Um, so game arrives, super excited, open up. It's like, I don't know, a world of treasures inside and we can't wait to get to play it. And uh, so we go through the rule book and the first thing we learn about the game is that for two players, um, if you want to go through kind of the introductory modes, you have to play two characters each. Um, yeah, um, and also you go through scripted turns. So I have problems with both of these options. The first, um, playing two characters is um, a bizarre, simply because I'm trying to learn how to play a game. Playing one character is probably loads for me to be dealing with. But also the nature of this game is one where you're trying to prevent each other from winning. Um, you know, in this kind of jostling for power thing, why would I be doing that with a character I was playing myself? Um, I found that way beyond my reach. The idea of a scripted turn probably appeals to more people more than it did myself. My issue here is that I didn't want to be told what I was doing on each turn. Um, I wanted to explore the actions myself and see what they did. I wanted to try stuff out based on what was in my hand or what I felt like at the time um, so that I could kind of, you know, sit in the middle of the game and pick it up piece by piece like that um, as opposed to be guided through it. So neither of those options sat really well with me. Um, so then we're like, I guess we're just going to play this like we would normally play it and we'll do the whole explore the game thing. And then it turns out that this game isn't really two player or well, it is as long as you don't mind playing with an AI um, character. So this is the Clockwork Prince. Um, and that was a real letdown um, simply because there's only two of us playing, meaning somebody had to control the Clockwork Prince. They had to play two characters. Same problem all over again. And not only that, the Clockwork Prince is kind of unwieldy and difficult to manage. He comes with a flowchart and also a two page like sheet of rules as well. Um, and it was just, it really drew out um, all of the turns and that because somebody had to engage with him. So, th but that's how we did to play our first game. And I think all of that was just a uh, letdown. Um, my biggest issue, I suppose, is that your game board is actually very helpful in telling you what all of the actions you can do are. However, looking up the exact details of all of those actions, because not everything is written on your game board, is not easy. We had a hard time finding out specifics and specific interactions out of the rule book. The answers were there, we just couldn't find them easily. And I don't know whether it's just these rules are difficult to remember or they're not intuitive. Um, I don't know what, but I've never had this much trouble really. Um, and so yeah, I'm, dis I'm disappointed <laughs> to be sure, because I think the game has tons of potential. Now, ignoring all that aside, you may be able to get over that and play on as normal. There are lots of things to love here. Um, I'm a big fan of a lot of how this game is put together. Um, I love those other factions where you get the favours from. I love that they have that pool of stuff that you take from and draw from. And you're trying to match those kind of symbols to make actions with them better. Really enjoyed that. Um, I like the fact as well that the game was so honest in what you were supposed to be doing. It was like, here is how you win. Please follow these steps. Really appreciated that. Um, I like the way the discard piles work. So each zone that you're in has its own discard pile. And when you draw cards to kind of see new advisors or get new cards into your hand, the discard pile moves one over from where you're located at so that someone else could go and check out your discard pile, which is cool, or you could go and do it as well. Um, I thought that was really, really fun and interesting. To be fair, there's a lot of things I, I really like about the game. I do think there's some very cool stuff here, but for whatever reason, it just didn't gel together for me into a really fun experience. Um, if anything, at times, it just felt like a bit of a slog because we were just wading through, you know, so much that you were trying to keep on board at one time. And it made me less eager to care about the game or want to learn more about it. Um, yeah, I think this is a good game. It's got lots of potential, but it's really weighed down under itself. Um, I don't think this game is that difficult. I really don't think it's that complicated. I don't know why it had to be so complicated. But yeah, that, that's what we got, people. So that's my review of Oath. 
I really want to really want to like this, but it's just not clicking. Yeah. <laughs> Do I think you should have Oath, Chronicles of Exile and Empire in your collection? Well, I think actually if you've got a dedicated game group who really enjoys kind of grabbing victory out from each other's noses, that you'll be a big fan of this one. You've been watching Board Game Inquisition. Why not like or subscribe to the channel so you can get updates about my future videos? Or if you have any comments or queries you'd like to make about Oath, why not shout them off in the comment box below? Tune in again for some more short and informative board game reviews.